If you could just take your seats. Um, so, hello everyone on this beautiful day. Um, my name is Corrine Yu. I'm Managing Policy Director at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And I'm delighted to moderate today's panel, uh, Why Big Data is a Core Democracy Issue. So at the Leadership Conference, as some of you may know, we convene tables of civil and human rights groups to confront the national advocacy strategies on a wide range of civil and human rights issues. Some of our current priorities include some of the topics that people are talking about today, voting rights, economic opportunity and justice, educational equity, criminal justice system reform. And um, in particular, we look at issues um, at the intersection of race and class and how they address systemic inequality in ways that limit opportunity for low-income people of color. Um, in these areas, from public opinion to concrete evidence of disparities and in so many other priority issues, we rely on data. Um, data is are a vital part of our work. We know that data helps tell the story of what's happening in America, and that's why we think it's important. But data does more than address structural gaps. It helps us understand how and why these gaps occur and why they grow wider. So what people are calling, quote, big data, and we're gonna talk about the definition of that, um, is an emerging issue that has real consequences for civil and human rights advocacy. So in February 2014, the Leadership Conference, joined by a coalition of other groups, endorsed the civil rights principles for the era of big data. And the principles represented the first time that these groups had talked publicly about what big data meant for the civil and human rights that we all care about. Um, the, and we talked about the importance of big data for communities of color, for women, for other underrepresented groups. The release of the principles were timed to coincide with the White House's review of big data and its impact. And through these principles, we highlighted the growing need to protect and strengthen key civil rights protections in the face of rapid technological change. Today, discrimination is not just the product of biased human decision making. Rather, as the White House noted in its report, which was released uh, later in 2014, discrimination can result from the way big data technologies are structured and are used, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as well. So this new frontier of big data is one that we need to work to understand um, and to address together, um, and our distinguished panel is going to help us do that today. So let me quickly introduce our panelists. Starting to my right is Rachel Levinson-Waldman, who serves as senior counsel to the Brennan Center's Liberty and National Security Program which seeks to advance effective national security policies that respect constitutional values and the rule of law. Seated next to Rachel is Evan Greer, who is the campaign manager for Fight for the Future, a cutting edge nonprofit that uses innovative viral technologies to organize some of the largest online protests in internet history. And then seated next to Evan is Harlow Holmes, who is a di digital security trainer for the Freedom of the Press Foundation. She strives to help individual journalists and various media organizations become confident and effective in securing their communications within their newsrooms, with their sources, and with the public at large. So let's start our conversation about big data. And by that, I mean data that is so large in volume, so diverse in variety, or moving with such velocity, the three Vs, that traditional modes of data capture and analysis are insufficient. Uh, the format of our panel is going to be in two parts. First, I'm going to throw out some questions to our panelists, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So, um, Evan, I, I was hoping we could start with you. Sure. Um, so, more as I noted, more data and more kinds of data um, are playing a bigger and bigger role in the future of democracy, some positive and some negative, um, as we were just discussing. Um, can you set the stage and give us a big picture of the kind of landscape that progressive advocates are facing? Sure. So I, I always like to start when thinking about data with just a very simple statement, which is that data is power. Um, and power is neither good nor bad um, inherently. Um, power, you know, as we know, can be used uh, to do good things in our society or can be used to do very evil things in our society. And the same is true with data. Um, and I think you know, the, Malkia and Edward Snowden you know, really set the stage for some of the really negative ways that data can be used um, to harm our ability to create change. Obviously, you know, COINTELPRO, the infiltration of the Black Panther Party, um, the disruption of the civil rights movement, um, 
that that's happened also in the labor movement, in you know, basically every social movement throughout history that has started to effectively chip away at um, the status quo, to chip away at the uh, incumbent institutions of power, um, those institutions have started to use data um, and use uh, surveillance and use uh, the ability to collect and monitor people um, against their ability to make change. The flip side of that, though, um, is that we all know that the more we know about what people care about and why they care about it, the better our ability as advocates is to get people excited and mobilized about things. And so for myself, um, as an organizer, uh, Fight for the Future, um, we do a lot of different things, but certainly one of our biggest tools is our email list, which is about 1.4 million people. Um, and I've, done, I've spent my life basically as an activist. I dropped out of college uh, and toured around as a musician. I've done a lot of different types of advocacy work. Um, but basically all of the organizing I did up until this point, I did without really any data um, about um, why people cared about the issues I was working on. And that basically meant I was fighting with one tan hand tied behind my back and in the dark. Um, because basically you just, you create a pamphlet or you create um, some material or you organize a protest hoping that that, that message is going to resonate, but you don't have any way to know ahead of time. Whereas now we're able to send an email to our list um, that's segmented where we send the same email with uh, a different introduction to 50,000 people and then to another 50,000 people. And that actually tells us which way of talking about this thing resonates with the most people. Um, and that doesn't just give us information in terms of how to get more clicks and donations and uh, petition signatures. It actually tells us how to mobilize people and how to get them uh, on our side. Um, and that is actually really powerful. So I, maybe that's a good, you know, a quick introduction. So, you know, data can be used um, to help us advocate, to help us make progressive change, but it can also be used very effectively by the powers that be uh, to disrupt our ability to do so. So it's, it's all about how we use it, who gets to use it, who has access to it, um, and a lot of the questions of transparency that I think other panelists are going to address. Great, great. Thanks for that. So, um, so Rachel, I wanted to focus, um, to drill a little deeper in the area of law enforcement. I know you've been thinking a lot about this. Um, and, and if you could talk about the, your concerns about the impact of big data on communities of color and low-income people. I think that'll help set the stage for our conversation later. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> so there are a few areas that I want to touch on, and I will be upfront about the fact that these don't all necessarily fit neatly into the category of big data, which as Corrine said at the beginning, is this notion of data that's sort of so big that there's, you sort of have to use new, new tools to figure out what's there and to pull something out of it. Um, I think big data is really important in this context, and then as Evan was talking about sort of just data writ large, kind of yep. a lot of data. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk about a few areas in which we're seeing sort of new uses of data that one of them potentially could be useful. I'm sure the other ones may have been useful in some ways, but I think they have real concerns for um, a few different kinds of communities of color. So the first is predictive policing. Um, and I don't know if this is a term that's familiar to people. Sort of the notion behind predictive policing is that it's kind of the next, in some ways, the next generation, although we should get a little more precise than this, of CompStat, of sort of, you know, the policing techno technologies, the policing tools that were rolled out in the 80s and 90s to kind of look to say, okay, there has been crime happening in various areas. How do we get officers on the street to respond to it and to try to do some crime prevention and not just reaction to crime. CompStat and systems like that were fundamentally basically sort of backward facing in terms of saying, oh, it looks like there's, you know, in this neighborhood there have been these particular kinds of crime or this incidence of crime. Maybe that means that we should put officers on the street. There are certainly a lot of questions to be raised about CompStat itself, but, it, but in some ways it was kind of linear. It was, this is what has happened Lots of questions about how that reporting works, how officers know what was happening, where this, what, what has happened, here's where we'll put ourselves. Predictive policing is kind of the next step or the next generation. And what predictive policing in their various kinds, but what it purports to do is to say, okay, we're not just going to look at kind of retrospective crime, or if we are looking just at retrospective crime, we're going to crunch it in a different way and try to make predictions about where crime is going to occur in the, in the future or potentially who is going to commit crimes in the future or who is going to be the victim of crimes in the future. And that may not be 
a perfect overlay with where it's happened in the past, and that is intentional. So there are various companies that have said either just using crime data or using um, social network analysis, social media, information about when schools are open, information about where bars are, what have you. We think that we can do even better predictions about where crime is going to occur or who's going to be involved. <clears throat> so obviously in some ways this sounds incredibly powerful. Um, there are real concerns about how this affects communities of color. Um, and I think sort of the, the most obvious and the one that I want to highlight is that obviously policing does not happen in a vacuum. And there are decisions that have gone into where police are on the streets, what crimes they are seeing, what crimes they are reporting, and, and, and sort of who is taking part in those crimes. Um, there are communities in which police simply aren't on the streets and will not be seeing certain kinds of crime. The flip side is that there are communities that are likely to report crimes to the police more than others. So there's this you know, somewhat skewed data that gets fed into a system. And it's one of the things we'll be talking about is sort of the transparency piece. But it's very hard to know in terms of what comes out the other end, is there any way to sort of cleanse or launder out some of, the discrimina some of the discrimination, the discriminatory issues that might have gone in on the front end. If not, then there's, there may be no particular reason to think that that policing is any less discriminatory on the back end, although certainly the companies that are involved in this say, look, we're, you know, we're doing what we can, we have these fancy algorithms, you know, we crunch the data. But then there's this additional concern that it may still be just as you have these discriminatory inputs, you just get discriminatory outputs, but it looks clean because it's data. Um, and there's sort of this sense that, well, it's data, it's gone into a computer, it's come out the other end, and so it must be fine. But at the same time, it's still very much being carried out in communities of color. I want to mention two other sort of programs or uses of data as well, because I think often when we're thinking about law enforcement, when we're thinking about communities of color, often we're thinking about African American communities. There are other communities of color, there are other marginalized communities. So after 9-11, um, needless to say, there was a lot of surveillance of Muslim American communities. Um, so sort of the best known example, um, especially on a local level, is the NYPD started a huge program of demographic mapping in the New York area, really in New York and New Jersey. Through tons of resources into this, there was a whole demographic unit. There were what are called mosque crawlers. They were going to mosques. They were planting informants. They were talking to people. They were, you know, like mapping out restaurants that were owned um, by Muslim Americans, basically trying to sort of crunch whether it was classic big data or not, kind of trying to crunch this data to figure out who's the next terrorist, who's planning the next terrorist attack, where is something going to be coming from. Not only was it uh, based on kind of discriminatory notions of who is actually doing harm. It was obviously, um, you know, based on uh, national origin, based on religion. It also yielded nothing. Um, so there was this, this big unit that was spending a lot of time and a lot of resources. Not a single lead came out of it. And the third one that I want to mention, which in some ways is somewhat more classic big data, um, I think probably everyone is familiar, and you know, in the in the panel just before this, Malkir Cyril and Edward Snowden were talking about this to some extent. The call records program, before the NSA call records program, which I think most people are now familiar with, there was a drug enforcement agency call records program, which started in 1992. It was massive, and then what that was doing was logging all the calls made from the U.S. to ultimately 116 countries a lot of which were in Central America and South America. And so that very much fed into the drug war and needless to say was very much targeted on Latino communities, Hispanic communities, immigrant communities in this country. And so there are all these sorts of ways that, that a variety of communities of color have been caught up in surveillance and in sort of this, this potentially discriminatory use of data. Thanks, Rachel. So let's stay on the law enforcement theme for a little while longer. Um, Melkia had mentioned, you know, the interest, strong interest on body-worn cameras, um, uh, intense interest, I guess, on the part of the public, um, because uh, body-worn cameras are, are viewed by many as a tool to promote greater accountability uh, on the part of the police. So uh, this seems like an opportunity to highlight some of the issues that we care about, given the strong public interest in this area, um, including uh, how to protect and enhance and reinforce civil rights. So Harlow, I was wondering. 
Um, Melchia had expressed concern that these cameras are being rolled out with little uh, concern about any policy or programs attached to them. Can you just comment on that? Yes. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, so uh, Malkia said uh, during you know, the last talk here uh, that people love body-worn cameras or whatever, but, and I quote, the details be damned. I actually <laughs> wrote that down. And uh, I come from uh, a technical perspective. Um, I I'm, I'm, don't come to DC very often, um, and I'm not a, a wonk, as like you guys so lovingly call each other. Uh, <laughs> but I find it, and, and also I, I also find it a little bit um, surprising to see how quickly the room cleared. Actually, now that we're going to like you know get into like dig deeper into a yeah. technical discussion about big data. Um, but for those of you who are here, thank you very much for sticking it out. Um, but okay, so when you say the details be damned. Uh, it actually it speaks to a little bit of like you know a Wizard of Oz esque type uh, story concerning technologies, especially body worn cameras. So, for instance, um, let's see. Okay, I, I guess I'll. Oh, there is a uh, there's a group you know called the CJIS, which is the Criminal Justice Information Services. And um, it's, you know, that organization actually issues security uh, advisories to police departments, law enforcement agencies across the country. And they have like a very, very, very um, regimented set of precautions that they want officers and, you know, implementers to take regarding things like body-worn cameras. Um, however, when you get into the, the, the weeds of the details of it, it's actually kind of frightening. Um, how little transparency there is between the manufacturers of these cameras and the police departments that are, are ultimately going to be using them. And I guess I'll kind of take you on like a little bit of a tour about how that works. Um, so first off, I'm not necessarily going to be talking about any vendors specifically, except for one who made a huge mistake. Um, but that said, um, what I'm telling you about you know, certain techniques and certain technological implementations of standards and protocols come to bear really heavily on the way that these cameras are going to be used in streets all over America. So um, really quickly, uh, let's say, uh, do you guys remember like the cell phones that we had back in like, you know, the early 2000s? And it was really, really awesome when we were able to take mobile video for the first time, right? And do you remember that quality of video, the very, very small resolution, um, you know, the kind of graininess of picture, there wasn't a lot of detail. Uh, so that standard is called um, H.263. It's been around since, two, uh, sorry, 1996. So it's a it's a 20 year old protocol right now. Oh, is that, that did I do the math correctly? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a very very old protocol, and quite frankly, it's a legacy protocol, which means that in the day today nowadays now we have iPhones and really high powered Androids and you know like all sorts of DSLRs, all these things. Um, that standard is like absolutely obsolete. However, there are certain camera manufacturers that um, still rely on that standard. And so when you think, and, and the reason why they do that is like, you know, um, a number of reasons. One, it has to do with the licensing of that standard, which is something that non-techies don't necessarily think about. Um, it also has to do with, you know, pretty much, uh, uh, they want, similar to mobile video, they want the video to be able to like leave the phone as quickly as possible and travel to, you know, the station for whatever live processing that must be done. But then when you think about other parts of you know, the surveillance apparatus, especially things like facial recognition, that starts to become a problem that nobody's talking about. So, um, oh, so like to take that a little bit further, when you talk about how uh, you know, the feeds from body-worn cameras uh, match up with technologies like facial recognition, and you think about the manufacturers of today's facial recognition software, which are usually in, you know, like um, in Israel and in China, um, where they train models of, you know, like people's faces uh, in, in, as regards to, you know, African Americans, you know, they train it off of Will Smith's face. And quite frankly, you know, uh, anyone that falls outside of those narrow, mar uh, those narrow, narrow margins uh, can end up being classified as something, you know, horrifying, like a gorilla, which we have actually seen you know, in Google search results, unfortunately. So when you think about like the imperfections that are baked into these technologies that are inherited from the people who are writing these algorithms and we don't get a say on what these algorithms actually are. Um, and so another um, danger in, in this, or not necessarily a danger, but something that we have to think about and especially for those of you who are like legislators, 
um, is the kind of uh, the, the pricing structure and the options that are available to law enforcement when making these selections. As I said, you know, there are about four um, major players in the body worn camera market. Um, they all have offered different products at different price points. So for instance, um, take Taser, which is like I think the biggest at this point. Uh, they have a, like several flagship products on you know like a scale of, of price. There's the body worn camera that actually clips onto your 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 uniform like around the chest area, and so that comes at like that's the cheapest one. Um, but then there's like you know for if you pay a little bit more, you can get a body worn camera that mounts onto a helmet, which not only gives you a different you know field of vision when you're actually taking footage. But um, it also, it's more secure. It can't be like ripped off and thrown away or like, you know, in the hands of someone who wants to tamper with the footage or something like that because the one mounted on the head is more secure. Um, so if you're under the assumption that actually like the, the decision between Model A and Model B that a police department will make will make a huge difference in like how justice is actually being done, you, when you match that up with, you know, the, the how most departments actually have this, this like uh, mandate that they have to take the lowest bid for you know uh, for contracts for for purchasing equipment that actually comes to play in a serious way, and so I guess I want everyone to be conscious as you're making decisions in you know wherever halls of power you reside <laughs> that these um, the minutia like the tiny details that like techies like I like, love you know figuring out they have huge impact that amplify down the line. Great, thank you. So uh, just changing gears a little bit because we didn't want to leave people with the impression that big data was just a law enforcement issue. Um, let's switch to the commercial realm um, for a few minutes. Um, so John Podesta, who the president's advisor who had steered the, the White House's big data review noted, and, and this, I'm, I'm quoting here, um, one novel finding of the working group report was the potential for big data technologies to circumvent long-standing civil rights protections and enable new forms of discrimination in housing, employment, and access to credit, among other areas. The statement in and of itself was novel, um, talking about a novel finding. And um, so let's talk a little bit about that. And, um, and what I'm going to ask the panelists to just um, address this second point that the report went on to say, which was whether big data will build greater equality for all Americans or exacerbate existing inequalities depends entirely on how its technologies are applied in the years to come, what kinds of protections are present in the law, and how the law is enforced. Now, for the civil rights community, these kinds of issues are front and center, so let's unpack that statement a little bit. Um, first of all, just going back to the new forms of discrimination um, in in uh, the non-law enforcement area. Um, Evan, I'm wondering if you could just comment a little bit about that and, and what you've been seeing in your work. Sure, so, I mean, there's so many ways. I think we're just starting, we've just opened this Pandora's box mm. in some ways, um, and we're seeing some of the more, I'll give some of the more egregious examples, I guess, of ways that um, companies are using big data in discriminatory manners that impact people's lives. So one, um, this hasn't actually come to fruition yet, but um, Facebook filed a patent um, basically on uh, a product that would um, help lenders determine whether to give money to people based on who their friends are. Um, so essentially, if you're friends with like a bunch of people who um, you know, Facebook determines are living in a certain area or engaged in certain practices, they would then somehow help lenders um, decide to, you know, how they're going to lend to people. Now that obviously, I mean, um, you know, anyone who knows anything about redlining and the history of it, that, you know, very clearly would feed into practices like that. Um, so that's one example. Um, another of my favorite slash least favorite examples of this is Victoria's Secret um, using data um, to determine what time of day women feel most insecure about their bodies um, by running a survey about this and then deciding they would target ads during that time of day, um, basically to encourage people to go buy underwear to make themselves feel better. Um, that, you know, those types of abuses aren't just, you know, we think of advertising and the way that corporations use data as being 
um, dramatically different from when the government uses it. And you know, in some ways that's true. The government can uh, incarcerate you. The government uh, can kill you if you're in another country um, or even here, actually. Um, so there are very real things that the government can do with data that corporations can't do. Um, but the abuses that corporations can conduct with the data is very real and does impact people's lives in very serious ways um, that can lead to loss of life or other types of suffering. So I think it's really important that we understand that you know, this isn't just an either or. And I think in some ways there was a little bit in this White House report that was kind of intended to like only look at the way corporations use the data and not as much with the government. Um, and the reality is, you know, big data, again, data is power and it can be used um, for positive or negative things regardless of who has it. And it's all about um, how we use it and, and who has access. Harlow, why don't you please um, comment? Well, I would continue that by, uh, by saying like, it's incredibly naive to say that there isn't an interplay between right. the way that governments mm -hmm. are using, you know, quote unquote, open data um, as a method of control. I mean, uh, so for instance, uh, we're just starting to see where uh, cases where people are being um, prosecuted uh, based off of whether they liked something on Facebook. And these are like, you know, supposedly not, uh, supposedly not supposed to be brought into evidence in, in court cases, and yet we're seeing this all the time. And it gets, like, as it snowballs, it leads to uh, things like, you know, gang injunctions, where people who live in the same neighborhood um, who, you know, just have common, similar social activities, but, like, X person is in a gang, and then all of a sudden, there's this digitally enabled dragnet that just, like, sweeps everyone in the neighborhood who you know share certain data points into the same thing and as much as like um you know it makes me feel really really bad when i see an ad that i feel is like not direct or directed to me for you know a specific reason that makes me feel really bad um however like that doesn't put me in jail but there's like no distinction between those practices and we just kind of have to push back on it mm. uh rachel you get the your, the legal question, you know, are, are the current protections enough to to protect us against these kinds of practices? And if not, you know, the leading question, if not, what more is needed? Yeah, I mean, I think I can address this most just because of the work that I do in terms of government use of data rather than criminal use of data. And I think the answer clearly is that no, the protections aren't enough. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One big one is just that I sort of alluding to this at the beginning, and I think we all have been talking about this, that there's so little transparency um, around what's going on. So just thinking about something like predictive policing, um, and, and this is, you know, to speak to Evan Harlow's points, very much an area where there's an intersection of commercial and government use of data. Um, you know, by and large, the police departments aren't developing the software on their own. You know, it takes expert um, technologists, expert programmers, um, and there's a big market in it. So they're buying it from these various companies. There are maybe three or four big ones and then a whole bunch of other ones. Um, there are these partnerships, there are agreements between the company and the police department, the cities who are using these, and there is very little, very little transparency about what they really are. So a couple of the big companies do say, you know, something like, well, we just use crime data, or well, we use crime data layered on top of all this other stuff. Um, one of the big companies, Predpol, says we use three years of crime data, and they say it's, I think, where the crime occurred, when it occurred, and what kind of crime it was. Okay, so that's somewhat useful, but in terms of what happens then inside that black box of the algorithm, um, they certainly aren't telling because they see it as um, an issue of intellectual property. That's, you know, what their business model is based on. And so I think there's no way to think about, I mean, this very much goes to Harlow's points about, you know, technical points very much affect the um, extent to which something can actually be used for the ends of justice. And, and this is the same. Without knowing what's happening inside the algorithm, there is no way to know is this an incremental step? I mean, certainly to the extent that data can be used to try to strip away some of the biases that would be there, that, that is important. It, it may be that it's imperfect, but better than just sending officers out on the street and say, you know, hey, go to the neighborhoods you're going to vote for and keep looking for the kinds of things you were looking for. Um, but it's very hard to know what the answer to that question is um, without knowing more about it. And I think that's true in a variety of realms. It's certainly true for predictive policing. It's true for sort of the national security surveillance that there's not a lot known about, you know, sort of what's happening inside that. And then especially when you're in, you know, sort of law enforcement writ large, a lot of the national security work is, some of it is taking place through the intelligence agencies, but some of it is through 
kind of regular law enforcement, through policing, federal and state and local. Um, and there's so much secrecy that happens. You know, the, and uh, Malkia Cyril was talking about this in the panel before this, you know, it's, it's an issue of power, but it's couched in terms of safety. It's couched in terms of national security. And that allows really for a veil of secrecy. And I think what we see time and again is that eventually when that veil is pulled back, it turns out, not always, but quite often, that there have been abuses at some point in there, sometimes intentional and sometimes because something has been allowed to operate for so long in secret that there's just not sufficient oversight for somebody to say, you know what, there's a bigger picture here. Uh, Harlow, we, in these conversations we hear a lot of talk about the secret sauce and the black box, and is there anything from your perspective that we can do to find out the ingredients of the secret sauce or open up the black box? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> one thing that's been giving me like a lot of hope recently is uh, seeing, for instance, yeah, seeing Malkia Cyril and Edward Snowden ha in dialogue actually uh, shows that there is, you know, this space that we're slowly but surely carving out where technologists, civil society okay. groups, um, you know, like uh, people who are concerned with criminal justice and other types of justice can actually get together and start pushing back on this opacity. Um, I think we need to continue that, like 100%. And also, like something that I feel that um, you know, my space being part of the or coming primarily from the you know, like uh, the free software movement and the uh, the open source software development movement um, has started to get better at, but we should get even better at and keep pushing us at it, which is like making sure that we are forming these bridges. Um, there is no reason why you know, like a civil justice um, group goes out there to fight this battle alone without actually having like technologists hardcore back them up with the facts to, in order for them to proceed. And I think that's how, um, that's how we'll win. Great. Um, let's come back to that because uh, at the end of our discussion, um, we'll do, you know, the rallying cry, call to action, yeah. all that good stuff. So, um, but before that, let's talk more about policy and the technology. Uh, so the White House report did talk at length about the notion of disparate impact. So, and, and you touched on this as well, Rachel, you know, it's the algorithms are unbiased, you know, so how can they possibly be discriminating against people? Um, but uh, the White House report addressed this by saying that um, big data can be used for great social good, but also can be used in ways that perpetuate perpetrate, excuse me, social harms or render outcomes that have inequitable impacts even when discrimination is not intended. So the implication here is that discrimination can result from the way the big data technologies are structured and used. Um, this is for all of you. Can you just uh, talk a little bit from your perspective what, this, what that concept means to you? And Evan, why don't you get us started? I think, you know, the idea that an algorithm can be unbiased in a war, in such a deeply unequal and discriminatory world is a little bit off to me, I guess. You know, it feels to me like when you have deep injustice and then you kind of do anything that like amplifies power, again, either from the bottom or the top, um, it's going to impact that injustice in some way. I think a good example of this is um, when, when Ferguson happened, um, you know, everyone was, sharing this graphic about how there was like 200,000 tweets about it before it was covered on CNN. Um, but it wasn't trending on Facebook for weeks and or for like two weeks or something like that. And that was largely because Facebook's algorithm was punishing content related to it. Um, do, and we don't really know why because their algorithm is not transparent. Um, whereas Twitter at that time didn't have an algorithm, although now they do. Um, so <laughs> we huh. can get into that. Um, but you know, I, I think, um, the reality is any algorithm that's not transparent and that's not kind of, um, that we can't see um, is only going to serve to exacerbate existing inequalities um, if it doesn't, in, unless there's some active and intentional way that it, it is actively confronting them. Um, you know, I think that sort of makes sense if we just think about, if you just take what society is and you do something that sort of just amplifies it, um, that's not going to change the structure. Um, whereas if we, you know, any algorithm or any kind of like box or whatever it is that or technology that we're talking about, if there isn't policy in place and the technology itself isn't directly intending to uh, push back on the inequalities in our society, I think it's only going to serve to amplify and deepen them. Tarla? 
Um, also, uh, this, this notion that uh, things get, or decision making gets better with algorithms, I think is like mis misplaced in the first place. Mm. Uh, quite frankly, before anything, we, what we need to do is kind of put a stop to that just mindset. Um, the more you, you, the more complex your algorithm is, then the more like, you know, discretion you wrench from a judge or from a police officer or from us. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the first stop. And Rachel? Um, I, I don't actually know if I have anything to add on this to, to these great comments and sort of what we're talking about before. I mean, except to, to echo, as I think we've all said, that, that there is this pull in terms of a lot of very good uses for big data. Mm -hmm. um, one of my colleagues was at an event earlier today talking about, you know, really important ways in which big data can be useful, you know, in terms of thinking about educational outcomes, health outcomes, all of these ways to actually get more transparency into issues where I think that hasn't been, and then ha sort of what the tension is between that positive value and other areas in which it seems like it, it's not really providing that transparency and it may not really be sort of, uh, you know, facilitating that push towards justice. Yeah, it's a really important point. Um, so um, I'm sure there are many other things that folks want to talk about. This is an opportunity now to do a lightning round of all the major issues that you'd like people to come away from this panel with. And then uh, we'll finish up with this part of the panel with the takeaways that you'd like um, people to um, walk away with and, and that call to action part that I, that I mentioned. So um, Rachel, um, why don't you start us off? Because I know your portfolio is very broad. Are there other issues that you think um, folks here should be paying attention to? And what, what could they be doing about them? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I feel like what my, my lens on these issues, I think, writ large, it's, it's the intersection of a couple of things. So it's, I mean, I do a lot of work on surveillance and national security and increasingly policing and technology because there's so much connection between those. The technologies are going from the national security space to the law enforcement space and back. Um, a lot of the justifications are sort of swirling around each other. Um, and I think this idea of having sort of public oversight and transparency to the extent possible, that there are some ways in which, you know, uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about, well, where algorithms are used, is no-fly lists that the government does, which is very much in the national security realm. Um, there is now starting to be a tiny bit more transparency on it, but because of years of lawsuits, um, really pushing and pushing and pushing, and judges saying, you know, to the extent that there is a particular person on a no-fly list, they have to have an opportunity to push back. And the only way to be able to do that is to have at least some information about why they're put on that list. Um, so I think in, and, and so, and there are these technologies, you know, I was talking about predictive policing, Harlow's talked about body cameras, I had sort of alluded to the use of social media, which is an issue in its own right. It's to some extent being used in the predictive policing context, although there aren't, I think there may be only one company that is including social media monitoring within predictive policing, um, but certainly there are a lot of companies that offer social media monitoring, you know, for, oh, do you want to know, you know, there is a political convention in town. Do you want to know what's happening? Do you want to know where protests are being planned? And you'll say protesting is a First Amendment protected activity, but there's a lot of slippage from, you know, oh, we need to know where there might be an outbreak of violence, and inevitably what ends up being monitored is, you know, where is Black Lives Matter planning happening? A lot of that is happening on social media. Um, and so that ends up being monitored and used. People end up getting targeted. Um, although I won't get into it, this obviously then gets into issues of encryption as well, um, which Malkia and Snowden were talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, DeRay McKess and others have been very vocal about the fact that what seems like sort of a, you know, highfalutin technological issue, national security realm, is very much related to how can people organize on the ground every day sort of in a fight for racial justice. Um, and so I guess if there's a takeaway for me, it's, you know, so much of this is happening um, at the local level. You know, Malkia talked about this, Harlow talked about this, you know, body cameras get rolled out, sort of the details be damned. Well, you know, that, that's getting rolled out at a local level. It's individual cities, it's individual police departments. And so having people who are engaged 
at a local level with what their departments are doing, with what their city councils are doing. That's really where this is happening. That's where you know purchase orders are being signed. That's where decisions are being made about, well, we're going to use this particular software package mm. to keep an eye on what people are doing. This is you know where decisions are being made about literally what does a body camera policy look like? What happens when we walk inside somebody's home and they ask us to turn off a camera? What happens when we walk up to a rally? Do the cameras keep rolling or not? And I will say on that, there I think there are actually good arguments on both sides. There's an argument that says you shouldn't be um, recording that because you are collecting information about people's exercise, their First Amendment activities. There are arguments, for instance, in DC, that <coughs> footage specifically is kept for three years because there's a history of the police cracking down on protesters. And so the idea is we actually should have some, some video evidence of what those interactions are. Um, but that's really where this is playing out. And so I think having people be skeptical and being involved in what, what may in some ways you know, seem somewhat dry, right? What do these policies look like? That really is what will determine how these policies are used going forward. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, but before we go to Evan, I just wanted to comment because we've worked together yeah. Um, yeah. on the body camps issue and in Brennan Center's, you know, got a great resources. I'll, I'll put in a plug for your resources. No, but I, but I should have mentioned <laughs> the, the principles as well because this is very important. Um, and the leadership conference and, and others um, released body-worn camera principles, and there's a, we have a scorecard that we put together with a firm called Upturn that is, um, that is basically scoring, to the extent they exist, uh, law enforcement policies against our principles. So, um, and the interesting thing that we found is that there is interest both on the part of law enforcement, you know, who, who Melkia mentioned the 95% of police departments who are either using body cameras already or considering using them, um, you know, they're going to get these cameras and then they're not quite sure what to do. So having uh, principles, I think, is enormously useful to them. Absolutely. And there's also interest on the part of community groups who really are best positioned, they're the groups on the ground, to be able to interact with their local um, law enforcement. And so I, I, we see this as a, an important, and I mentioned this before, important opportunity to, uh, to use the body camera debate as an entry port point into uh, broader issues of criminal justice reform, you know, not as the end in and of itself, but the t as a as a tool, um, and so um, that's a very long-winded way of, no, of, get, of, those are very, of very important summing up what you were additions. saying. Yep. Yeah, um, and I think um, something that I think is, you know, because the issue is so much on the forefront of the public, and because the public under seems to understand the issue, you know, we're going to get a lot of traction out of that. I think. Um, Evan, um, in terms of other issues you'd like to highlight for this group and, and major takeaways, yeah, what do you I, have? Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, I think one, one thing that's really important to understand about data is that it really doesn't stay put. Um, and it's very hard to protect. Um, and so even if you like intrinsically 100,000% trust the US government, that it will always do the absolute right thing with data that it collects, which I don't recommend you do. <laughs> um, you know, it's like once data is collected, whether it's by a government or a corporation, um, it often gets leaked. I mean, the FBI was recently hacked in, and the information about 20,000 FBI agents was, was released. Huh. Um, we all know the director of the CIA had his AOL account hacked. <laughs> um, you know, AOL. I mean, these are like, yeah, uh, we could all ask ourselves why he had an AOL account. But, um, you know, it, so again, even if you totally trust law enforcement that they will never abuse this, um, you know, someone else can get this data. Um, and I think if, if we think about body cameras specifically, um, you know, there's literally, we're talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours of footage, um, sometimes in people's homes, as we said, or um, some a, a police officer responding to a domestic violence incident, things like that. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that that information would never end up getting leaked, would never end up getting posted online. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that if the NSA was investigating, or, or the FBI were investigating someone for a terrorism case, that they wouldn't go to that local police department and say, we want all the body cam footage from this neighborhood, um, and that they might be, you know, likely would be able to get it unless there was some serious uh, uh, protections in place preventing that, um, but so just you know, I think both with corporate survey or both with corporate collection um, in terms of using it for profit and to make money, or whether it's the government. Um, once data is collected, um, it can be used by a lot of different players, not only the player that collected it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredibly important to understand. That's a great point. 
And Harlow? Um, so in which case, I mean, that does harken back to, you know, our, our um, debate about encryption and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, because we all want um, more data. Uh, everyone on either side of the aisle, on either side of this conversation, we do want to see more data um, in service of accountability. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, I mean, this is a good thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when you know our governments and corporations are vulnerable to such data breaches, like you have to expect and you have to prepare for that inevitability. So um, our uh, enemies, you know, like international or abroad, and and uh, those even at home who just even those who are just doing it for the lulls or whatever, like you know, they're going to uh, they're going to be seeking access to these assets. Uh, with increasing um, interest and increasing, you know, like frequency, and so you have to see a back door as a death trap. You just have to look at it like that. Um, but another thing that I wanted to bring up was actually, um, uh, once again, in, in service of data for accountability, uh, is that there's a little bit of hypocrisy there, and and I'll explain what I mean. Like, so for all of these, like, you know, black box algorithms that give us even, you know, the the uh, the impression that these algorithms are like, even though we don't understand, they're just like so advanced and like we're always gonna get the, you know, we're always gonna get our man and like blah, 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 whether it's true or not. Um, however, like it, fo we're focusing a lot of resources on this particular branch of, of work when we're not thinking about other like, you know, technical tools that are supposed to like balance out the, these power structures. So actually what I'm talking about is foyability or the mm. FOIA ability of, of these things. <laughs> so like uh, FOIA is an amazing tool and uh, but like jurisdictions don't usually have the capacity, like the technical capacity to respond to them in a timely manner, which is of utmost importance. And we've seen, um, and not only, you know, like uh, sometimes it's a mistake, sometimes it's understaffing, sometimes it's like lack of resources, but we've also seen examples where the lack of capacity has been intentionally leveraged in order to halt an investigation. And so if we want like FOIA to work in its ideal form, which we all know we want, we have to request that people put equal resources into just strengthening that capacity. That's great. Uh, FOIAbility, <laughs> that's the word to take away. Um, yeah. The other word I want you to remember before we uh, close out this part of the panel and turn to Q&A is, um, there's an issue that I hope that we can all work on together um, in uh, beginning now and leading up to 2020, which is the census. Um, the Centennial census is really the original big data. It's the count of everyone in the country and it's a key civil rights issue. Um, this uh, time around, uh, the census form is going to look different. They're making changes to the form and it will also be, it'll be filling out in a different way because there will be an internet option. For the, for the census. So talk about uh, issues about confidentiality and hacking and all sorts of things. You know, this is, this is big. So um, I wanted to uh, leave you with a thought that um, the census is coming mm -hmm. and then pretty soon the census will be here, but it's not too early to start working uh, on these issues, the policy decisions uh, that will help ensure um, a good census are being made now, um, and, and it's a top priority for the leadership conference. So with that, um, I think we are going to the audience for questions, and um, if folks have questions, I th it looks like there's a mic in the back that um, people can use. Hi, thank you so much for this very uh, exciting and interesting um, conversation. I want to pick up on one comment that um, Harlow mentioned early on, which was the, um, the Wizard of Oz narrative, which I find often happens in, in, a, in an important way in conversations about technology, where people who feel like they're not equipped to have a technological discussion then shy away from the policy conversation. And I have to say, so far, no one's spoken ones and zeros of binary code on this table, and I, I, in this panel. I think it's very, you know, a very accessible conversation. My question is, where does that narrative come from and what can we do to combat that so that we have a broader conversation with more people involved in having questions about technology, the implications of technology, the questions of big data? How do we broaden the, uh, the appeal of this conversation to people who 
maybe think on the one hand, I'm not equipped or technology is a wonderful tool and because my iPhone works perfectly, why wouldn't everything else work perfectly? What do we, what do, we do to break down that narrative and bring you know, th that I can't or shouldn't be involved and bring more people into this conversation? Um, <clears throat> well, well, first off, actually, I would like to kind of throw all of the <laughs> accolades on Fight for the Future <laughs> and, and yeah. similar groups. Uh, you guys did a really, really excellent job of um, kind of humanizing these, uh, these issues in a way that people kind of get. And sometimes it's, an, it's a question of, of marketing and messaging, mm -hmm. where like, you know, we want people to like visit this like viral website that shows exactly like how you know reckless your data can be in the hands of or rather others can be reckless with your data if you know like if you're not vigilant enough and uh, things like that actually like really really advance the conversation in ways that are really helpful um, and secondly like be, or maybe not luckily maybe luckily is the wrong word but um, I guess it's kind of serendipitous that. Uh, so much of these these decisions or and, and even tools share so much in common with like the commerce sector. The fact that like the majority of these dragnet tactics actually are just totally cribbed from the ad industry. And when you start messing with people's money, uh, you, they 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 get tend to get it a little bit more. Did, Evan, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, um, I think I mean definitely it's about like figuring out how to talk to people. But I think it's also one of the big problems that we have is, is caused by the root of inequality where marginalized people by and large are left out of these conversations. And so you have all these people talking about NSA surveillance um, and not talking about like police um, and mass incarceration and like the actual real impacts of this technology and how it harms people. Um, and I think, you know, most people are like, yeah, the NSA, like, they're catching terrorists, like, over there, far away. That's not real for people um, in the same way that, like, oh, my friend is in jail, my brother is in jail, my mom is in jail. Um, you know, I know lots of people who have been killed by police or hurt by police. Um, those types of things, um, I think, are important. So I think one real, very real way to address that is to amplify the voices of marginalized people in these conversations and listen to what they're saying. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that would go a long way to addressing this kind of gap uh, of understanding. I guess the only thing I'd add in some ways is a very sort of wonky point to make, but that there's also sort of a civic responsibility. You know, if there's a, let's come back to policy, right? But if there's, there's a policy that's being considered, you know, on body cameras, that there's some obligation also on the part of the city council, whoever it is, to, to do a little bit of a breakdown, right? To say, look, th these are the five things that we're struggling with and we're going to tell you what they are in very accessible language. Maybe there's some, you know, confusing code behind it, but, but the issue is how do we connect that with people and, and help them understand it? So I think there's that obligation as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would just add, I think that's a really important point. The translation point is really important. Um, the coming at the issue from, you know, the, the not first with the tech, but from the policy mm -hmm. standpoint is really important. Um, and I think uh, the other thing is, is that I think it seems like people are kind of learning together at this point. The technology is moving really quickly, more quickly than I think even the technologists sometimes can mm -hmm. understand it. And um, that's what makes the, these issues both um, exciting, but also it's kind of scary. So um, anyway. Can I just add one tiny thing? Sure, of course. I, I think part of it also is breaking down this barrier between politics and technology. Like even, I mean, you see it in like the media, right? Like most newspapers have a tech section and a politics section um, as if those two things are very separate. And right. when you, you know, especially lately, the tech section is basically all politics. <laughs> um, and that actually drives me nuts as the media person for my organization is when I'm trying to explain what we're doing to a politics reporter, they're like, oh, go talk to the tech reporter. And I hope there are no tech reporters in the room. But, <laughs> you know, m many tech reporters, it's like a revolving door from like industry people and they just don't get activism. They don't get what we're trying to do and they ignore it. Um, whereas I know the person who's writing about climate change for the New York Times or something would actually understand what we're doing better than the tech reporter. Um, and I think, you know, we just need to start breaking down that barrier because, of course, technology, like, dramatically impacts politics in our lives. And I think that's, you know, part of it is just getting people to understand that and, and not think of them as separate. Thanks. Uh, next question. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Lai Kelly. I lead a program called Resilient Democracy with a group of academics um, institutions that is looking at how to make sure Congress is strengthened and successful in the information age. So I work a lot on information architecture. To your point, I mean, this, uh, the split between politics and policy is very real in the technical infrastructure of Congress, for example. Um, campaign technology used for governing makes governing look like campaigning, yet the most uh, popular use of social media is petitions and um, shaming, um, and we have to get beyond that. And I am on the Hill every day talking to members about uh, useful steps forward um, for including uh, constituents in the policymaking process simply because the rules changes over the last five years allow for amazing acceleration of inclusion if it's done right. Um, my question for you is, do you notice a learning curve or uh, benefits from the Obama administration's open government uh, initiatives, but also for them recruiting heavily and bringing uh, all these technologists into government? Because my sense is that there's a lot more empathy for institutions now in this conversation. Um, we just, I just helped set up a technologist uh, fellowship for Congress, but it's really been focused on executive branch, and we, we really need just more IQ points on Capitol Hill to be able to address both the technical systems and the policy challenges. As you said, you can't separate them. Are you seeing that learning curve happen? Because I'm really looking forward to it hitting a critical mass where we really get competent. Uh, little by little, mm -hmm. um, I guess only like anecdotally, like if the uh, I've had a number of friends who have gone on to positions within like, you know, the White House um, mm -hmm. advising on technical uh, matters in a way that I think is like really, really savvy and and quite frankly, it made me very proud. Um, the work by 18F, I guess, as you know, we, we head towards uh, like our, our now uh, internet-based census and things like that, like that's going to uh, revolutionize like our, the way our country um, tackles these issues in the future in a way that hopefully will um, be maintained. Uh, I do kind of wonder uh, in, the election, in the upcoming election cycle um, how the various policies um, that uh, we inaugurated during like, you know, the past eight years will kind of have like, hopefully not, but like a chilling effect on the way that those policies are perceived. Like I don't wanna see, um, you know, I don't want to see uh, uh, funding cut for, you know, something like 18F or, you know, the, the Tech Fellows Program cut because like they just didn't like, you know, the Obama administration or they didn't like Hillary Clinton or something like that. And that would be really disappointing. Um, I'm personally don't yet have faith that um, uh, that you know the majority of politicians that you see on the stage nowadays as we lead up to the primaries get that yet and I guess maybe we should just uh, amplify that message that this is a good thing I, I'm, oh sorry no. okay. Go ahead. I would add one other thing to this which actually which isn't about whether there's more kind of technological expertise getting to the hill but a related issue, and I think this sort of gets back to issues that we and also in the previous panel were talking about, is you know, how much can policy accomplish and how much can the law accomplish? And so I will say, as somebody who is also involved in very much tracking legal decisions coming out of the courts, writing briefs to the courts on some of these issues, it's also been a big issue there, right? To what extent are judges educated about technology? I do a lot of work on surveillance technologies in public. So certainly body cameras are part of it, surveillance cameras, cell phone trackers, license plate trackers, a lot of these things. And the extent to which your constitutional rights are bound up in an individual judge's understanding of what that technology yes. is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will say we have been starting to see more. It is, you know, as always, judge by judge. Um, but I think there, are, I think there are judges who are getting more savvy. I think there are there are clerks, you know, the the law school graduates that are working for judges to sort of help them understand these issues. I think they're getting more savvy. I I tend to think that some of it is a trickle down from the Snowden revelations, even though that wasn't related to sort of street level policing, there's kind of this understanding of this bigger architecture of surveillance. Um, but so I think that's the other area where we're really seeing it oh, and hoping that the judges get educated sooner rather than later because you know these cases are coming down every day um, and usually they're criminal cases. So usually you know it's a 
defendant that's not that sympathetic, but the, the larger principles are really yeah. important. And the extent to which the judges understand the technology and the impact is really important. And so we're seeing it in, in that you know, sort of level as well. Hmm. Great. I have probably several questions, but I'll try to focus it a little more. I worked with Office of Technology Assessment for a while, which could advise Congress, could have advised Congress on some of this. Much of what we're facing, we can forecast what the issues are going to be, because we can get a pretty good idea where technology is going. But as usual, if you don't have a, an injured party or you don't have a constituency that knows they have something at stake, you have no standing, either in Congress or in court. But where I was going, I guess, is it seems to me that you need a, some form of either oversight or trust in third party to either advise the court, advise Congress, advise whomsoever, even the consumer, because there are private interests that have their own reasons for using the data, some of them very legitimate. We get a lot of free information because we're willing to have advertisers pay to learn about our behavior and what we're doing, and until we're willing to pay for that, we'll probably continue to remain on the dole. But we don't know what the real price of that loss of privacy is because we're not very well educated to it. The same thing with almost every other user of the technology. So who is the trusted party that you can go to? And one specific question I have in terms of implementation has to do with accountability in, let's say, a legal action, a police you know, investigation or something. If an algorithm or a technology is used to identify a um, perpetrator or to accuse someone or something, I would hope that you would rely on other types of evidence rather than the computer evidence to make that judgment. For example, um, in the case of the new program that just played Go, it was a learning program, there is no algorithm in the sense that even the authors of that program couldn't logically tell you why the program made this move at that point in the game. It's not transparent even to the authors. So these technologies are going in a way that they are not intrinsically accountable. You can't trace out what they did. And therefore, I think we have to have a sense that this technology warned us of a problem, you know, a hot spot in crime or a terrorist network or whatever, but we need to have independent ways of verifying that and adjudicating it. And a, a second thought is, what is, the, what is the prospect of having, essentially, when someone has an encrypted phone and they won't, de they won't allow access to law enforcement, that they would essentially have to take the Fifth Amendment? In other words, if you could subpoena records that are in paper and get them released, some try someone tries to subpoena records that are encrypted, if they don't release them, they're essentially having to take the Fifth Amendment, namely that fear of self-incrimination. Just two thoughts, just off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> is, uh, first off, I guess working backwards, um, your uh, Fifth Amendment plea in the Fifth uh, argument, is that a statement? Is that something that you, you it's see? An idea. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's or not. It's right. Idea. Well, I, I'm not a <laughs> constitutional lawyer, but uh, yeah, I guess. Um, if anyone wants to run that up the flagpole and see who salutes, I, I'll encourage them all for it, <laughs> definitely. Uh, also, um, you raise an interesting point about, um, yeah, uh, are there certain types of, uh, um, so what he's talking about, about the Go program is it has to do with um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence that is based off of neural networks, which is like this new frontier in, in computer science where, um, that is, you know, kind of a, a, a black box where um, you train it on observations that you as a human being has, have collected. Um, there's some magic that happens in the middle where those decisions that you initially make get amplified and amplified and amplified in, in, in ways that you can't actually observe in order to guide the behavior of the artificial intelligence. And so you have to wonder, is that, um, do, like just by, by, by dint of that, being like what it's about, if we want to introduce such practices into you know um, uh, predictive algorithms where you know justice is concerned, and 
we will definitely, I mean, maybe we should have that conversation. Um, I don't know who would be interested in, in, in spearheading it, but it would be great. Um, and I guess to like come back um, to your initial thing, uh, whoever uh, does end up advising, we just, we have to make sure that um, uh, it's as, it's as across the aisle, or like, you know, we're on both sides of the aisle, we're getting north and we're getting south, and we're listening to uh, these uh, civil rights groups primarily, because literally, like, they, they fight the fights first, and they already kind of have an idea where it's going. Um, no one asked about, uh, you know, algorithmic policing, like, I don't know, 10 years ago when um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the um, digital boot was introduced in, uh, cars that you would lease in like very, very, very low income mm. neighborhoods and mm. stuff like that. And it took us decades to kind of catch up and say like, oh wait, we've been doing that for forever. We should have had this conversation, but no one was listening, mm. so. Could, oh. oh, do you want to comment? Could I just make a few quick comments in response? So in terms of the Fifth Amendment issue, um, you can only invoke the Fifth Amendment for what are called testimonial statements. So if you're in court and you're being asked to testify, you can take the Fifth Amendment. In terms of encryption, there have been arguments that like being forced to disclose a password is a violation of the Fifth Amendment, and that is um, in some flux. It kind of depends what the information is. In terms of, of people who are, who are overseeing this, you know, there, there are a bunch of bodies that are involved in this. It's not that either the federal government or state governments are totally devoid of anyone doing oversight, doing privacy protection work. There's a Privacy Act, there's actually a new Privacy Council that the Obama administration just formed, bringing together, making the privacy officers in each agency a higher position, bringing them together into a group council. There's the Federal Trade Commission. There are a whole bunch of ways that people are trying to protect privacy, both from a consumer point of view and from a sort of criminal information point of view. It's just, you know, do, does that always work? Uh, and you know, clearly the answer is no. Okay. Another question. Hey. Hi, my name is Marissa Liebling. I'm the legislative director at Project Vote, so I'm not at all a tech person, but obviously sometimes these sorts of questions uh, find their way into policy discussions that we've been having. And I think you've actually touched on some of the questions that I have, but I wanted to put it in perhaps a little bit of a, a kind of real world example and get your thoughts for us non-tech people. Um, and this has to do more with the collection of additional information uh, than big data in general. But for example, an issue that I have seen debated is on a voter registration form, is it a good idea to actually, in a state that does not require it, require it, add additional fields to collect ethnicity data and especially language data so that you can provide better language assistance at the polls or better track the disparate impact of bad policies and that sort of thing so you have that benefit. But of course then you're just inherently adding to collecting more data that could be abused. In this age of big data where there's already so much out there on this, us, how much of that is a real concern? And if it is, how many protections can we really put into a policy when you say, like, the government shall only use this information for these purposes? How naive are we being, even aside from sort of hacking and other things, but of limiting the government ourselves? Um, really quickly, uh, I don't think anyone ever uh, does believe that, well, I mean, with the exception of egregious um, uh, overreach uh, as revealed in the Snowden revelations and similar, uh, no, like, as far as like, you know, civil society is concerned, no one thinks that data is a bad thing in and of itself or that, you know, contribute, willfully contributing data to like a larger project is bad. And so, I mean, if you unpack it, the problems are actually in issues of retention, how long and where, how is that data being protected, and who has like legitimate access to it. And I think that if you, I mean, there, you could throw on a couple of really, really great principles as well, but like if we just have this list of what we demand to see when data is involved, then we're all going to be okay. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think just, you know, it sort of goes back to my previous point about data not staying put, but also policy doesn't stay put, right? So, you know, the next time there is like a really serious terrorist attack or something like that, if 
there's a bunch of data sitting somewhere that maybe we said we weren't going to use in a certain way, um, that can change very quickly. And so, you know, there, it, there's just all, you know, we need to fight for protections, but we also need to bake into, I think the trans, it really comes down to transparency. We need to bake transparency into all of this so that we know um, how it could be used and we kind of envision that, um, you know, beyond just how we say we're going to use it when it's initially collected. But I'm not sure that goes specifically to your question about people volunteering data. That seems a little bit different. Um, but it just, that's what it made me think of is just that, you know, as the same way data doesn't stay put, policy doesn't stay put um, and can change quickly when things happen. So with that, I think we'll bring the panel to a close. It's been lovely talking to you folks about these issues, um, and I hope people continue to stay engaged. So um, thanks very much, and thank you. Thank you. Sure.